third video in this new series titled An Introduction to Geometry Nodes. This beginner-friendly tutorial series will cover both the basic and more advanced topics in Geometry Nodes. So whether you don't have much experience or just want to explore what Geometry Nodes are all about, you are in the right place. Our main goal in this tutorial series will be to recreate the legendary Blender Guru Donut entirely using Geometry Nodes. So, what are Geometry Nodes in Blender? The Blender Geometry Node system was introduced in Blender 2.92 and had a major rewrite in version 3.0. It is a node-based system, similar to the shader editor, that allows users to interact with geometry in a non-destructive procedural way. What do I mean by non-destructive? Typically, when modeling, we perform transformations, extrusions, scaling, rotations, move things around using modifiers and many other techniques. But if I made an extrusion two hours ago, I can't easily make it a bit longer now. It's late for that. This is known as destructive modeling, and that's perfectly fine. It's a common practice and really nice way to model things. However, in some scenarios, it's nice to have more control and be able to adjust things dynamically. For example, I developed an icicles and snow system. Of course, you can try to model it and sculpt it by hand, but if you then decide to change the building slightly, you need to sculpt that part again. And it's gonna take some time. The Geometry Node system, as you can see, adapts and works dynamically. By the way, if you would like to try this ice slash snow system, you can find a link for it in the description. We can create many unique effects for animation, stylized renders, buildings, terrain generation, and much more. Blender Geometry Nodes are becoming more powerful with each release and learning them can really benefit your workflow. So, without further ado, let's jump into Blender and see how we can use them. The donut is the goal in this series. While the system might not be the fastest or most reusable, it showcases the immense power behind Geometry Nodes. So, in the first part of this series, we will focus on creating the main dough part and mostly on understanding how this system even works. This is a basic tutorial, so don't worry, you don't need any prior experience with Geometry Nodes. Enough talking, let's finally jump into a new Blend file and start creating this donut. I'm working with Blender 4.2 in this tutorial series. To start your journey with Geometry Nodes, first, inside Blender, you will need to go to the Geometry Nodes tab. Here you can see three main sections, our classic 3D viewport, the spreadsheet that I will talk about later, and the most important part, the Geometry Nodes editor. To create your first system, you just need to have an object selected, like the default cube, and to click this new button here. Great, there you have it, your first Geometry Node system. To zoom in, you can scroll the wheel on your mouse or press Ctrl and the middle mouse button and drag the mouse. To move around, hold the middle mouse button and move. If you want to move a node, select it with the left mouse button, hold and move it around. Like in the 3D viewport, we also have the end panel here with additional options and a toolbar under the T key with just three tools, select, annotations and cut which allows you to cut through node connections like this. So, when we focus on the Geometry Nodes editor, we can see something similar to the shader editor. We have two nodes, group input and group output. You can think of it this way. The input is the state of our object before the Geometry Nodes modifier. Yes, Geometry Nodes are modifiers and you can see them under the modifier tab. And the output node represent the state after the Geometry Nodes modifier. So, everything in between, where this green wire is right now, will be our workspace for the Geometry Nodes setup. Our goal in this series is to create this yummy donut, and we will do that here. First, let's learn how to edit this geometry. One of the most basic operations is Transform. To add a new node, you can just use the shortcut Shift-A, or click the Add button at the top. Let's search for transform. Now we have created our first node. Great job. To connect it to our system, we can simply place it over the green wire and the Blender will automatically connect it for you. 
You can also connect nodes manually by dragging the wire from the output of one node to the input of another. While we are on the topic of outputs, let's discuss some terminology. Most of the nodes look like this. They have inputs on the left side with different shapes and colors and outputs on the right. The most important input type is geometry, represented by the green circle. Some nodes do not have inputs, but we will discuss them later. Another way to create nodes is by dragging the wire from an output and then searching for the node you want to add, such as the transform node. Now, let's talk about the middle part of our node. This is where we have additional settings to tweak. There are hundreds of nodes, each with unique settings giving you endless possibilities. Our transform node has four main sections. First, the drop-down list with two options. I will leave it on components because matrices are the topics for a different tutorial. Below, we have three important sections. Translation, rotation and scale. The three most basic operations in any 3D software. If I change the value of the transform, as you can see, we can move our cube around. Furthermore, we can rotate and scale it. Let's add another transform node. To duplicate a node, just select it and click Shift D. Now we can transform even more. You can start to see the power of geometry nodes. Even if we perform many transforms, we can still go back to the initial scaling and change it. Or we can add additional scaling just before everything else. And this is still a modifier, so we can turn it off and still modify our original shape even in edit mode. I hope you can start seeing why this approach can be so powerful. Let's start making our donut then. Let's delete all transforms node by selecting them and pressing Ctrl X. This way, the connection between input and output remains. If you use delete, we would need to reconnect them. For now, we have our input geometry, the default cube, in our geometry node system. But this won't be of much use because the donut isn't really a cube. We need to create a more torch-like shape and we will do it entirely with geometry nodes. First, let's create a circle. To do that, search for curve circle, important, choose curve, not mesh. You will see why in a moment. To preview that node, use the Alt Shift shortcut. Remember to enable the node wrangle add-on for this. As you can see, we have a nice 2 meter diameter circle, a little too big for a donut. Let's adjust the radius and set it to maybe 5 cm. As you can see, we can write the numbers directly into nodes even with units. Blender will automatically handle the conversion to meters. As I mentioned before, we need a torus. Currently, we have a circle curve. Curves in Blender have one nice ability that we can plug a profile into them to create a tube or pipe-like geometry. So, if we plug a smaller circle as a profile, we will be able to create a torus-like shape. Let's do this. To achieve desired results, the best way is to use Curve to Mesh node. Let's search for it by dragging from the output of the circle node. And as you can see, this node has two geometric inputs. One of them is for profile curves. Let's duplicate our circle by selecting it and pressing Shift D. Change the radius to 2.6 cm and finally plug this node in as our curve profile. As you can see, we have created our torus. Great. One useful thing would be to control the radius of the torus outside of the geometry node section. To do something like this, we can drag more outputs from the output node, like that, and plug them into the parameters we want to control in the modifier tab. Here, I want to plug it into both radius values. Let's create one more parameter, and as you can see, under the modifier tab, we now have two values. To rename these labels, go under the end panel in the geometry node section, now group section, and double click on the labels to rename them. If you want to know more about the modifier section, 
and how to create interfaces for GeoMatch node system, you can check out my other tutorial here. After renaming, we can now control the radius of our donut with these sliders. Great. The next thing I would like to control is the resolution of our donut. I will be using a lot of displacement later, so it would be really nice to have more geometry to work on. We can of course adjust the resolution on the circles, but I prefer a more automated approach. For example, we can use the resample curve node. Let's add it between the curve circle and curve to mesh nodes. And this node changes the number of points in our curves. As you can see, we have three different modes. Currently, we have a fixed number of points, but we can use the length option. Now, if we set the length value to something small, we get much more geometry. Let's duplicate this and paste it into the second circle. Now, if I change the dimension of the donut, the resolution adjusts automatically. As you can see, changing the resolution affects the shape of our donut. So, this is a still an important parameter worth exposing outside the geometry nodes. But for our displacement, the resample will work great. The last thing that I would like to do in this part is to create a flattened area in the middle of the dough. To do this, I will use another new node, the Scale Elements node. Let's add it. This node allows us to scale geometries around each individual's part origin. It is set to face, which is correct for us. Uniform scaling scales the objects in all three axes, and we can also specify one scale axis if we wish. If I change the scale, we will have a smaller or bigger donut. You might ask, couldn't we just do the same thing with transform? But this node gives us one powerful feature, the selection socket, the pink one. As you can see, it is diamond shaped. We will cover the difference between diamond and circle inputs outputs in the next part. Currently, we can think of this as selection. We want only the center part of the donut, this ring, to be scaled. So, how do we select it? With attributes. What are attributes? They are basically pieces of information like a color, a number, a vector and other types. These values are stored inside the geometry in vertices, in faces, in edges and so on. The places where the attributes are stored are called domains. To create your own attribute, you can use the store named attribute node. Let's add it and I want to plug it here. Why is that? The place where we store attributes matters a lot. For example, if we had four spheres and we stored a random color for each one and then added one more sphere, this new sphere would not have this attribute at all. We want to store this attribute here because I want to get that gradient. This gradient is called the spline parameter. Let's add this node. We want to use it here because the spline parameter works only on curves, so we need to use it before our transformation to torus because the torus is a mesh. As you can see, this is the first node outside the input that doesn't have any input sockets. This node only provides information. To preview attributes, we can use the Ctrl Shift shortcut. Let's plug both the circle and the spline parameter factor output into the viewer node. Now you can see this gradient. Make sure you have viewport overrides enabled. This gradient represents the progress on the curve. 0 at the start and 1 at the end. Black and white values. To store this attribute, you just need to plug it into the store named attribute node. Ensure that you have the float option selected and that you are storing this information inside points. Let's also name our attribute spline factor. Now, how do we use this attribute for our torus? First, 
we need to get our attribute here. For that, we can use the named attribute node. I use this node so often that I added it to my quick favorites. You can do this like this. Now, let's search for our attribute that we created, the spline factor. Great. Let's preview it with our viewer node and the control shift shortcut. Excellent. The black values mean zero and the white means one. The spline factor is a gradient from zero to one, so we don't have any doubts about it. However, some attributes can have values much higher, like a thousand. No matter if the value is one or a thousand, Blender will display it as white. So, to see the values, you can enable attribute text under viewport overlays. Now, I want to select this area which has a value of zero. To do that, we can use a simple boolean map operation called equal. Let's drag and search for equal. Set it to zero. The epsilon value tells us the accuracy of this node. If we set it to 0.1, for example, values like 0.03, 0.005 or minus 0.04 will be selected. Let's plug this in as our selection. As you can see, our scaling works perfectly now. Great. Let's analyze our setup a little bit. The creation of the torus was pretty straightforward process. The fun starts with attributes. Here we created our attribute, stored it, and it goes here, with our geometry. We pull it out from the geometry and use it here for our calculations. Finally, we are using the output for our scaling as a selection. This part is called the field, which is extremely powerful and I will talk about it more in the next tutorial. In the next tutorial, I will explain in more details the concept of fields, sockets, colors and shapes and much more. If you don't want to miss the next part, you can subscribe to my channel to get notifications. Thank you so much for watching. If you'd like to support my channel, you can check out my Blender add-ons or the file from this tutorial, links in the description. Thanks again for watching, see you again soon and bye!